Hi, this is Arkeem Ra. This is Disclosure Now. Today we have Daryl James talking with us. Um, he's somebody who has been in the Super Soldier programs. Um, his story's a little bit unique, I guess, like everybody's story. But um, yeah, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for uh, coming aboard. Um, I met you at Journey to Truth conference. Um, you're a really nice guy, and I also was blown away by your testimony. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to kind of talking with you a bit more and asking you some questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was. We had a fun time. It was a good. I liked it the second time more than the first. So, yeah, that was a that was a really good conference. Um, everything went really smooth. Um, and I just had a really good time. And yeah, that was that was a wonderful conference. And it was a really great way to meet a lot of people, a lot of good people. So you yourself included. Um. So I guess just where did your story start in these programs for people who aren't familiar with you just starting uh, from the ground up? Um, what happened to you? Well, I was in, I served seven years in the military and um, first I was in battalion, they call it. And then um, I went to uh, England. It was a secluded base in uh, Newquay, England in Cornwall. And, uh, it was mostly like tin mining and like sheep, sheep farmers and tin mining and things like that. But uh, yeah, it was called uh, JMF Joint Maritime Force RAF St. Morgan Royal Air Force. It was a Royal Air Force base and it was an underground base. And uh, I actually worked in the garage. I didn't work in the underground base. And I was a CB construction battalion. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I got picked up from the bit from the airport and the first class petty officer said this is a really weird base you really didn't go into detail you thought it was, everybody just thought it was a strange base who didn't actually actually work in the underground base and um like this when i first got there probably the, the first monday i was there i was asked to escort some uh, civilian workers from corporation siemens into the underground base and um yeah so i went and when you first go, you're at the quarter deck, and the quarter deck is like the lobby of the base. It's where you check in, it's before you go on leave, like vacation and everything like that. You you sign out with them, and uh, there was like a sliding glass door, like this plexiglass door, and they walked through the door, and I was actually following them because I had never been in an underground base, and I thought it was weird that I had to escort them like my first or second day of work on this new command, this new base, and. Uh, there was something looking like an airport metal detector. It had it was like rectangular walls with like a rectangular roof. It had like a little hump at the bottom with like the black and yellow caution tape vertical. So you know you would you wouldn't trip over it. And they just walked around it. The first guy said, "I'm not going to that bloody thing." So I thought, well, I don't want to go in, you know in it either. So I went to walk around it, and there was a guard behind a stainless steel table with a green beret and a rifle over his shoulder, English guard, and he said, "Uh, you know, you go through and." I thought, well, okay. I, I went through. I just thought it was a metal detector. Watched them do whatever. They fixed the pump, and then we left. And then um, on the Friday, I had a balls before watch. They call it in the military, which is like uh, midnight to four in the morning, zero hundred to four in the morning. So uh, yeah, and I, I walked in, and there I saw the Satanist uh, Michael Aquino. He was a colonel, and he was pretty old. He was like his hair was mostly gray. But he had like the curved up eyebrows, like, you know, like the horns. And I saw him on Oprah when I was a kid, and that's why I recognized him. And, um, yeah, I said, you know, good evening, sir. And I saluted him, and he said hi. And he asked me where I was from and how I liked England. But he was reading papers on the uh, on the desk of the quarter deck. He was standing up reading papers. And uh, I kind of think now that maybe he was, like, looking at my files, because I really didn't know what was happening at the time. But I kind of think now he was maybe whatever I walked through that machine, that scanner, it was like a scanner. And then so the following Friday, I had another balls before watch, which isn't common. They usually don't give you two Friday watches at midnight before, which is like the worst watch when they call it balls before. But uh, yeah, and I was just with a first class petty officer and he pointed at the computer he was behind. He was just behind like a Dell computer. And uh, he said, what do you think about that? And it looked like a photograph of like a, a gray, like in a black and white picture. And it was like looking up, standing in a room, looking up. And I said, what did you get that off the internet? And he said, no, look, and he pointed at a window. There was a window next to that sliding glass door before you walked in the base. And there was like a separate room behind it with a table. And it was about like 
six inches from the floor it ended about six inches from the ceiling it's a very big large like plexiglass window and there was like a little gray it looked like standing behind it it was like light brown it had the big black eyes it had like a, a fold of skin from its tear duct down to its cheekbone and uh it was just standing there and he said do you mind if it comes in here and i said does it mind if i stare at it he said no and i remember it said like in my head whatever it was it said i don't mind and uh it walked out of like that separate room and it came out from the plexiglass sliding doors so the plexiglass doors and it was a guard the same guard was right behind him and it had like a it had like hands were like c-shaped very long fingers very long palms and it had to kind of carry its hands like that or it would have drug them on the ground it would have Around without even bending its you know knees or back and uh it had like a little pistol in its hand a little silver gun it looked like a pistol I, I said gun and i just came back to my rack so i like i stood up and i said gun 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 and they both said you know it's not a gun and it, it held its hand out and showed it to me and it was just like a polished metal like pistol and uh you know the guard he had his rifle down at the ready so i was like well i guess it's not for it for me so i just sat back down and uh, it took apart like a Dell computer that was on the ground, just a junky Dell computer in it. But it, it didn't have to guide the, it, it was actually a drill, this little pistol, it was a little drill. It didn't have to guide anything in, it was just every time, it's boom, 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 like a machine. And it was catching every screw in the other hand. And it slid the top off, popped out two gigs of RAM, grabbed, it, it went up to the table next to it, it had the reach up so it was small, grabbed two other gigs, slapped them in, one motion, Split it back down, and it was able to like flick the screws back in between its fingers every time. It, was, it kind of did it like that. Didn't have to, you know, set it or anything like that. Just boom, 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 boom. It just got the screw in every time. And uh, turned around and let me look at it. And I looked at it, and it kind of like was like moving back and forth. I would go this way, and it moved for me, and it moved the tans back and forth. And I remember I tried to touch it, and the first class petty officer said, "Don't touch it." And uh, I got bored with it, and it walked away. And uh, he said to me, uh, what did you think about that? And I, I said, I thought it, you know, pretty weird. And he said, do you think you could work around something like that? And I said, yeah, I suppose. And I think it was just a test to see if I'd run away or if I'd attack it or what. And uh, he started looking at the computer. And uh, he, at first he started saying things like, do you have any hobbies or anything like that? And I said, you used to play classical guitar. And he's like, oh, they like that. And then he asked me if I had tattoos. And I, I said, uh, no and he said good the germans don't like tattoos and the germans he's like yeah there's germans up there and i said where and he said in the moon and beyond i said you mean like space and he said uh you know you can call it that you know he, he didn't really refer to it as space he's like yeah kind of you can call it that and then he said you know you're pretty smart you know you know he said you're really smart and i said really and he, he goes yeah like really smart and he showed me like these uh and i said what do you mean like 160 you know 165 iq and he said more like 190 195 and he showed me these color-coded kind of lines on the computer. He said, come here, look. And he said, here's the smartest guy on base. And I found out later that it was the executive officer that was the smartest guy, on base, the second in command of the entire base. And uh, you know, he said, you know, here's this guy above you, and then here's you, and then there was a gap, and there was like a bunch of lines. So it was like there was kind of a, a big distance between us and the rest of the guys. And he asked me why I became a CB, and I said I had a marijuana paraphernalia charge when I was 19. So all I could be was like, you know, CB, construction, cook, a boatswain's mate, things like that. And he said, well, that doesn't matter in this program. He's like, that won't matter here. And uh, yeah, he was just asking me all these things. And he said, yeah, you'll be able to play your guitar anytime you want, because you'll be an officer. He said, you'll make an officer with your scores. And uh, that Monday, the uh, XO came. He's the guy who was the smartest guy on base. But all the people were coming up to me, all the guys in the base, you know. And they were also saying things that it almost seemed like the command wanted me to know. Like, uh, like one time we were playing Halo, and um, and this is before I saw the gray and things like that. This is when I first got there, and I just saw I think I just saw Keno and stuff like that. And they said things like, you know, we were waiting for the next game of Halo, and they said, hey, did you see that reptile today? And I thought they were talking about like maybe like a big reptile that kind of walked on all fours or something. I, I don't really know. And um, Another one said, yeah, he was big. And I thought, well, you know, a big, like, monitor lizard. And another one said, yeah, and he talked funny. And I said, what? And I said, yeah, you know, there's lizards on the ground. They talk funny. You, you, they, they talk to us. And the guy said, you're new here, so, you know, you wouldn't know that. And um, 
I said, you mean there's like big monitor lizards that walk, you know, on all fours and talk to you? And they go, no, they walk upright like us and they just speak to us. And I thought they were messing with me. I didn't really have to think of it. And uh, it was just one big thing like that after another was just getting thrown at me. It was really fast. It happened really quick. And uh, yeah, and so the XO uh, came to the garage on uh, a Monday. And yeah, and guys were coming up to me and saying like, wow, you're the second smartest guy on base. You know, like right after this happened, and they said, you know, you know who the smartest is? And I said, no. And they said, well, you know, it's the XO, the smartest guy on base. He has over 200 IQ. And because, uh, you know, these were guys that worked in the underground base. And it was a small command, so, you know, rumors fly and people found out stuff. And uh, yeah, he, he came to my garage, and one of the guys came up and said, you know, hey, James, you know, the XO wants to talk to you. And I, said, I said, is this common? Because it was a new command. I thought, oh, that's weird. They usually will call you to their office, but they don't come to where you work. And he said, no, this, that's not common at all. So I said, all right. And I walked out and I said, you know, morning, sir. And he's like, hey, come take a walk with me. So we walked for a while. And at first he was just asking me how I liked England and things like that. Then once we got to the sidewalk, we got further away from everybody. He said, uh, you know, how does it feel knowing you have 195 IQ? And I said, you know, this close to 200. And he's like, he said, well, it's never enough, is it? And I said, well, you know. And he goes, oh, you found out, huh? And I said, yeah, you're the only guy on the base smarter than me. And he said, uh, who told you? And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And so eventually I just said, yeah, this guy told me. This guy we called uh, Lando, like, because he likes the Star Wars. Lando Peruvian. Like the Star Wars stuff. And uh, hey, we, we, we carried on. And he said, uh, have I ever heard of Project Solar Warden? And I said, no. And uh, he explained to me uh, Gary McKinnon, who was a Scottish man, who less than two years ago at this time, this was 2003, and uh, 2001 is when he, he hacked into NASA, Gary McKinnon. And he found this file, and the name of the file was Project Solar Warden. And in the file, he found things like uh, ranks and secu social security numbers of uh, off-world officers. And when you're in the program, you find out later that off-world officer doesn't mean like someone from Earth, it's off-world. It means actual ETs, like someone who's born on another world. For off-world means like there's off-world Germans, you know, and it's off, off different uh, ETs and things. They call them off-worlders, off-world. And uh, yeah, and pictures of cigar-shaped craft over the moon and things like that. And he said it's all real. And he said the only reason that the United States didn't extradite him from Scotland was because he would have been able to call witnesses. There was already a lot of uh, celebrities defending him, and uh, it would have blew the whole lid off Solar Warden, so they just didn't go any further. They let him go. And then he said, uh, if you volunteer for this program, I guarantee you'll make pilot of a four kilometer long starship. And uh, I mean, it was just kind of mind blowing. I said four kilometers, and he knew the exact mileage and everything like that of, of what a four kilometers were. It was really mind blowing. And uh, he, uh, Yeah, I apologize. I'm getting a call right now. I don't know if you can hear. <laughs> What's that? I can hear you. Okay. Um. Yeah. If he told you that that you could with your what what you tested and stuff, you could be piloting a four kilometer long starship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I asked him about that machine I walked through, and um. I said that, that machine that you walked through, that metal detector, when you first go on the underground base, it not only did your IQ and everything else, and that's where they got all my scores from. I'm not sure if I said that. And um, it also, the guy was saying things like, you know, you smoke, because I smoked cigarettes at the time. And he said, but you know how many blood clots? And he said, uh, that's because you drink, because I drank a lot at the time. And uh, so I, I asked him, I, I said, uh, I asked the XO, I said, my father died of a, something called a widow maker where he didn't get any kind of warning or anything like that. No cholesterol or anything like that. And uh, he just died from a heart attack. And I said, if we had technology like that, it would have saved his life. And he went on about like, you know, population control, you know, we couldn't release things like that in the public. So um, I said, well, there has to be a side that wants to release this to the public, you know, there has to be like a, some sort of a side. 
And he said, you mean like a trader? And I said, no, sir. I, I said, it just has to be, you know, a side that wants to release this to the, to the people. It, it just made sense to me. And he said, well, there is. And I said, well, if you get me on that side, I'll do it. You know, he shook my hand. And I saluted him. And as uh, we, he was walking away, he turned around and he said, one more thing, Mr. James. He said, uh, you're going to be escorted by a reptile and he's big. And I really didn't know what he was talking about. Like I heard what the guys talked about before, but I still didn't really wrap my head around what, what was going on. And uh, that was, I mean, that was it. And then I remember before I joined it, it was probably like the night before. It was going to be another Friday. So I'd, I'd have three like midnight to four watches on three Fridays. And uh, I was at the TV room probably on like Thursday or something like that, Wednesday or Thursday before this Friday. And I left the door open. You know, the door was open and it was like the break room of the barracks. And there was a guy across the hall and his door was left open. And it was almost like he was talking to someone, but he wanted me to overhear him. And he, he said something, he was saying things like, uh, first you're going to be taken into a density chamber. You'll be strapped down. And he said, uh, artificial density chamber. And he said it's to uh, push you up artificially from third to fifth density. He said, uh, the ETs that we work with are all mostly fifth density and they're much too fast and strong and intelligent, you know, for us to actually work with them. And he said, you'll become stronger, faster, your IQ will go up 200 points and you'll become more of a collective. When you're in a group, you kind of become that group. And uh, I didn't know, you know, I, I just overheard what he was saying. And so Friday came and um, I was in like my working blues, you know, uniforms, and uh, I had to sign a lot of papers, like a lot of papers, and, you know, he was like initial here, it was that same first class petty officer, initial here, he'll sign here, and he was just going through, and I got kind of cold feet, because I was reading it, and, it, and it, the, the way it was worded, it was very strange, it was saying things like, you know, the consciousness of the first party now belongs to the second party, and things like that, it was like really bizarre the way it was written out and um so i, I, I kind of got cold feet and the guy said look you're already back there so just sign the damn papers and what he was talking about is they have to send you back early when you get age regress because it takes a while so i was already back like in the underground ba base being age regress so i had already come back like i was already back from the program even though i was here so i signed it and he said sit down and i sat down and then uh got on the phone he said all right send him in and I waited I don't know about 10 minutes or so and then he said all right go with him and behind that same like big thing of glass in that separate room in the quarter deck there was just like this huge reptile he was big and dark brown and he had like a kind of ridges like mohawks going down his head he had like gold alligator eyes he had like a flat face and a mouth that went straight across and then straight up and uh, very large. He had very large shoulder muscles. He was in the tight blue uniform. And, uh, you, you know, he said, go with him. And I stood up and I said, Jesus Christ, said, what is that thing? And uh, I said, he's, he's not going to eat me, is he? And he said, uh, he's much faster and stronger than you. If he wanted to eat you, he would have done it by now. And I saw it sigh when I said that. I saw a big in inhale and a big exhale. And I, I said, uh, last one could read my thoughts, I thought. I said, he can't read my thoughts, can he? And he said, yes, you could read your thoughts. And he said, uh, I remember in my head, I said, sorry about that. And um, so I got up and I was really nervous. And there was this other guard. He was a different guy. He was an off-world German, he was, but he was dressed the same uniform. It was like this British uniform. And, uh, you know, he was a skinny kid, like a skinny young, younger guy. And so I got up and eventually I just went in, I, I walked through the doors and he walked out of this separate room, this large reptile, and he's really big. I think he had like a bit of a nub tail. He didn't really have like a long tail, he had like a nub. And he was walking like kind of big, he kind of walked like that. And he was like nine and a half feet tall, he was very large. And in the underground base, they have like these uh, white, blue and red lines and it white secret, blue top secret and red is like above top secret. And uh, so, you know, white just went straight down halls usually, and then blue went to separate rooms, and then red went everywhere. And then there were some halls that were only red, and they were just dark hallways.
and he immediately like went, went one of these down one of these uh, dark hallways and i thought like an automatic light would come on like a motion sensor or something and nothing so i thought you know i guess these things can see well in the dark and uh we got into larger rooms it got to the point where it got really big and there were things like bicycles leaning against the wall and like golf carts and things like that so i guess if somebody had to go deeper down to the base jump on a bike or you know get into a golf cart and take off we were gradually going downhill like walking downhill and uh this uh this guard kept on butt stroking me hit me in the back with his rifle and um you know i, I told him I, I said i'm not looking around or anything so you know please stop hitting me in the back and i really i really didn't know what was happening when i thought he was just some guy some british soldier that was just being a jerk and uh yeah, so he did it again, and I, I grabbed his rifle, I put my foot behind his, and I just threw him on the ground, back first, knocked the wind out of him. And uh, I heard the reptile real deep say, leave us. And uh, the kid stood up, and he's looking at his rifle and looking at me, and I just held it out and grabbed it, ran away. And uh, I turned around, and the reptile was just right in my face. I looked straight up and I could see like, um, you know, his eyes peering over his chest muscles. He was huge. He was like flexing all his muscles, letting me know how big he was. And I remember the first thing that came to my head was I just said, uh, I'm sorry for what I said before. You're much more civilized than him. As far as like, they're not, you're not going to eat me. Part of like that. And you can't, when these things are mad, you really can't tell the sense that they make uh, facial expressions because they don't have muscles in their face. You just, their eyes just get like real squinty. Like his eyes got small. When I said that, they got big. And we kept, we kept on walking and he said, follow me. And we walked and I was just following him and I was looking around and we eventually got to like a catwalk, like a few stairs that went up into this, you know, doorway that had a sealed door. And we walked into the sealed door and uh, there was a chair, a large, big chair. It was for one of them and it had holes in it and there were straps and it looked like a gas chamber chair. I, mean, I saw like a gas chamber when I was a kid and like an anti-drug program. They, they brought like a gas chamber trailer and it really freaked me out as a kid and it was just something like from a childhood it, it really scared me i thought this thing was trying to kill me because i had the sealed door and everything and i had the chair i tried running out and it grabbed me and threw me in the chair like i weighed nothing and uh it was starting to put the straps in on my right side and i was trying to get away and he uh like pushed me back and um you know i felt like his fingers here and his palm here so that's how big his hand and he said, um, well, the first time he headbutted me, I blacked out. I didn't realize, like, I just lost consciousness. Then, when I was trying to get away again, he said, don't make me hit you again. And uh, when he did that, he got real close, and I jammed my thumb in his eye. And um, he leaned back, and he just pushed against my chest till my heart, you know, until my chest collapsed into my heart and I just passed out and I woke up and I was completely strapped in and I remember he said uh I'm sorry I had to do this to you and um he started hitting like I don't know what it was switches or knobs or something but it was in the it was like a wall where I couldn't see it was like the wall same wall as the door was on so all I could see was like a peripheral of him doing something and uh he walked out closed the door and I got almost like kind of like an out-of-body experience feeling Whenever I got pushed into the higher density, it was almost like a like a weightlessness, cold, and then just like a peace all of a sudden. And um, and I was like, uh, lost consciousness. I came to, and uh, the straps were off, and I was kind of looking around. I was still sitting in the chair. And I looked to my right, and there were three guys on a, like a mattress, like a king size mattress that was just on the floor. And they were laying shoulder to shoulder, and they looked like they just got picked up from the club, like they were wearing like shirt like button-up shirts and things like that one was wearing like a motorcycle jacket and uh they were all in, like laying on the floor in the same density chamber with me and i saw the reptile's back was to me and he was gesturing like he was talking but he wasn't and there was a guy in front of him kind of looked uh like mournful and he was just like you know kind of doing that doing it back to him and the guy was dressed like a like a gestapo he, he had like his hair slicked back he was like blonde hair was slicked back he had an undercut, but he was wearing, you know, like the leather trench coat and the knee-high boots and everything. And he was actually a first-class petty officer on the base. So, you know, and uh, Robert later, later on told me that, that this XO, this my command, he 
executive officer. But yeah, like he was an off-world German, this first class. Um, there was a senior chief with a mustache. He was a first class. The S3, who's a fourth in command, he wore glasses. He was, uh, I'm sorry, off-world German. These were all off-world Germans. Senior chief, first class petty officer. So, so these guys these that guys you say, that you initially met um, on base, uh, like that you thought were Englishmen or American troops, you found out that they're actually off-world Germans? Yeah, they're spies. Yeah, they were off-world Germans. Yeah, the, the doctor of the base, who was a lieutenant, he was an off-world German. So yeah, like these guys, they were like, yeah, they're like, they're kind of spies in the sense where nobody really knew, but you know, the, the XO and the CO knew, they knew they were off world Germans, but like nobody else really knew. And, uh, yeah. And I slid down the chair and I like, I fell down to like, you know, my, I was, well, I was on my feet and I was kind of swaying. I was really out of it. And I said something like, uh, can I go to sleep now? And I fell down to my hands and knees. And uh, I saw the boots come in front of like my field of vision, and I heard the guy say, uh, "I should have you executed for what you did to my man." Do you hear me? And uh, the reptile said, "It doesn't matter. He, he doesn't remember." And I just fell down and I lost consciousness. I remember being carried by it like a duffel bag, kind of had me under its arm, you know, and my head was facing the opposite way. And I came to, and he was right on my bladder, and I had to go to the bathroom. And I kept on telling him, "You know, put me down. I have to pee. I have to pee." He wasn't listening. I just passed out. And I uh, came to, I, well, I saw a bright light. And I, I kind of opened my eyes and I saw, you know, like a large surgical light over top of me, like you see at a hospital. It was like the LED kind, the one you see now. It was just like a bunch of LED. I was in this very big medical bed. It had like the railings on the sides and everything like that, but it was a large one. Like it was built kind of like for a reptile. And, um, I heard ripping and tearing and I was looking straight up and I just saw it. It wasn't looking down at me. It was just looking straight ahead, this big rip top. And uh, I was really out of it. It was just like kind of like an ignorance is bliss kind of thing. And I heard uh, ripping and tearing and things like that. I heard like, and uh, it was like a woman and she was putting heart monitor kind of things on me, putting things on my chest. And I remember the reptile said he has to urinate. I heard a long one. She gave me like a catheter. And, um, I said, uh, I saw her and uh, she was pretty to me. And I, I, I said, uh, you're pretty. Can I hold your hand? And she said, after I'm done, you can hold my hand. And then the other, uh, and it was actually a woman on base named April. And she was like an IT, but I guess she volunteered for this program too. And she became a nurse. And um, yeah, so they they did everything to me and I held her hand and I just, you know, fell asleep. I passed out and uh, I came to, and then she came in. I was kind of by myself for a long time. And I was really like, I remember it was just kind of a, I was amazed by everything. It was just like this higher density and it was like, difficult to explain. It was just, colors were different. Sounds were different. You kind of catch yourself going from the future back to the present. Like you, you, you feel like you, you, you understand that, you know, there's no such thing as time. You have like this kind of sense of where you can go down tie your own timeline very easily and then come right back to where you were was very I was entertained by it almost like a like a like a three-year-old kid I was kind of looking around and entertained by everything and this woman came back in she had like a bag she put it down on the table and she uh started doing this basic physical things to me like hit my you know hit my knee with a hammer put your fingers between mine and squeeze things like that and then she had a smart glass pad and uh which is like a plexiglass rectangular pad what yeah. the smartphone is based off of and she put her hands on it, activated, and then an image came out, like a 3D, 3D image, and it was like a humanoid. She was able to put her finger in it and spin it around. And she went into the heart and opened up the heart to see the circulatory system, the brain, things like that. She was doing that. And then, uh, yeah, she went to leave, and I said, you know, don't leave me. And uh, she, she kind of looked at me and said, well, I'll be here tomorrow. It's okay. And I said, uh, I said, I don't know what to do or say. All I know is I don't want you to leave. Me. Like I, I took her hand. She liked that. So she just like grabbed my hand and took me out. We, when we went out, it was like we were in, a, it was almost like a, like we we're in a condominium, like a courtyard of a condominium. It, it kind of looked like there were lifts going up with no railings or anything. Just like these blocks, these 
square blocks were going up and going to people's rooms. It was like five stories high. The ceiling was lit. Um, behind me, there was like guys leaving to work, I guess. You know, and there was like trains behind me. I remember seeing like a train behind me. And they were wearing like light gray suits, like jumpers. And uh, there were women like on the balconies of the like, condominium. And they had babies and they were waving. She grabbed my hand and uh, we went to a lift. And it went up and it took us directly to the room. And I remember seeing a woman with a baby and she was just standing on like the sidewalk. And we were on like the fifth floor, like the highest floor. It was about five stories high. And um, there was no railing. And I said, aren't you afraid you're going to fall off? And she said, oh, no, you can't fall off. She just stepped off. And she said, you know, there's like a field here that protects us. And she said, the kids play on it. They're not supposed to, but they do. And I said, well, how far does it go? She goes, all the way to the other side. You can run all the way across the other side. And uh, this woman, you know, she took me into a room and it was very Spartan. It was just like a coffee table, a couch. There was like four bar stools, like a bar, a, test, a desk right by the door. And uh, she grabbed my hand, went into the bedroom and she started to kiss me. And then, you know, we started to kiss. And she said, wait, what's your name? And I said, I don't know. She said, come on, think. Everybody knows. Everybody remembers their name, she said. And I thought about it. And I said, Daryl. So we started to kiss. And we wound up having sex. And then she was, uh, I was laying on the bed. And I had my head rested against, like, the uh, headboard. And she was laying on my chest. And I just dozed off. And it was like I was back in England. It, like, happened, like, that quick. It was really weird. But that first, like, day, I remember so vivid just like i'm talking to you and um yeah i kind of had like a feeling of you know like talking to people i remember seeing like blonde hair blue people with blue suits i remember being in a lot of pain i remember being carried but you like can that. only really remember like the first day of being there yeah it was like the first day i remember like i've had really that ha i've had that happen to me too mm -hmm. at, at that first class petty officer when he was trying to get me to join the program he said um he said, nobody remembers. He said, some people remember the first day or two, but nobody remembers more than that. So I guess that's something common that people remember the first day. But yeah. And um, I don't know. It was just, I woke up. I, I kept on saying, I was like, I was like, I was with a woman. Like, it was really weird. I was like, I just snapped out of it. And it, and I was back in England and it was just, I couldn't explain. It was so confusing. And um, my uniform was laid out on a, on a chair in front of me. I was staying in the barracks, and there was, like, a wooden chair in the barracks. And it was just laid out. You know, it was just, like, the pants, and then the top was on top, and then the, the shoes were tucked up underneath. And I was like, I wouldn't do that. Like, it was weird. Like, somebody just took my uniform off for me and put it on a chair. It wasn't in the closet or anything like that. I still had, like, my socks on, like, my black dress socks. And I was like, I never go to sleep with my socks on. And uh, it was just really bizarre. And... Uh, I took my shirt off because I was just like, all right, well, you know, it's just, it's weird how it's funny what you'll accept. And um, I noticed I was like really toned. There was like a full body mirror and I was like in really good shape. And uh, I was stressed out. So I put like my fingers through my hair and I had like burnt stubble on my hands. I did it to my chest hair and I had burnt stubble. And I was like, why do I have burnt hair on me? And uh, I came out and there was like a guy, it was one of the guys that was when I was playing Halo and they was talking about the reptile. He said, uh, congratulations, you made it. And I said, what? He said, a lot of people don't make it back. 20 years is a long time. And I said, what are you talking about? And like, he, I really didn't know what he was talking about. And I don't know. It was just like that. And it was bizarre. And I went through a long thing of depression. For months, I was really depressed. And uh, I remember I went to um, the bar on the base. And nobody else really went to the bar except for me and like these four other guys. And like three of them would always sit at the bar. They're older guys. And then there was a guy like my age, like in his mid twenties who sat like on one of the tables, you know, in front of the TV and watch TV with me. When I walked in, he said, uh, Hey, it's the king of the Titans, man. He's, he's what's up, man. And I said, uh, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, Kino fucked you up. He's like, I don't know why you tried to poke that reptile in the eye, but Kino was pissed. He messed you up bad. And, uh, I didn't know what he was talking about. Like, and I said, like, what's the tie jet? And I said that right away. And he said, uh, he said, well, have you ever heard of Billy Meyer? And I said, no. And he's like, yeah, he's like, Billy Meyer, you look him up on the computer. He's like, you'll find him. He's like, work with the Pleiadians and stuff like that. He's like, that's what, 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 who they are. So, you know, I got a computer and I, I was looking him up 
things like that. But he would say other stuff to me that was weird. He, uh, he said, like, yeah, he could really play guitar, though, right? He said to the other guys. And they're like, yeah, he did play guitar. Because the other guys were telling him to shut up. Like, not so to say things like that. Yeah, I mean, not so to let him know things like that. Shut up. And, uh, but yeah, and then they they started talking about me, me playing guitar. And I was playing with Kino and stuff like that. Kino was playing the flute. And I was playing guitar. And I was like, what is this guy talking about? It was just That's, very fucking, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, and it was just like, I was just at work. You know, I was just at the, at the bar on bass. And I was just, you know. And it was really bizarre. And um, I called him the goon. He, was, he, has like a, he had like a shaved head. He was pretty big. And one time, he, he, they would say weird stuff. Like one time he said, like, I've been at this command for 20, you know, 21 years or 22 years or something like that, he said to the guys. And I looked at him and I said, you don't look more than 25 years old. And he kind of like went, oh, like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Like he got drunk and every now and then he would say something that he shouldn't have said. Really weird. And I remember one time they were all giggly and stuff in the bar and they were talking really fast, and um, he said, uh, "I said, what's wrong with you guys? You know, what are you guys on? Like, I could tell they were high." And they said, "We're on Chrome, man. I thought they were on cocaine." I was like, "No, we're on Chrome." And I said, "What's that?" And it's like Adrenochrome. And I said, "What's that?" And he said, uh, "It's something you get from kids." And they were just like in a like a you know they were all together like in a circle, all talking to each other, talking really fast and laughing and giggly and stuff. And uh, he told me that. Well, the guys on base, they told me that Tom Cruise came to the base. And these are the guys, like the guys who worked on the in the underground base, they just thought this was a um, a place to find subs, like Russian subs. It was close to the Arctic Circle, and they were monitoring subs. But it was like the real mission of this base was that there's caverns on the ground, and only like the Satanists were there, and there's like elongated skulls down there, grays, reptiles. What do you remember about Tom Cruise? Well, yeah, he said the guys on base, they said like, I said, well, why was Tom Cruise on the base? And they said, we don't know. Like, nobody knew. I, I thought, well, maybe he's doing, like, a role. They, they said they let him in the underground base. And I only been to the underground base once. And I really didn't remember anything else. It was almost like they went back and kind of wiped out the, the few, first few days out, too. And uh, I thought, that's fucking weird that, you know, they let Tom Cruise into an underground base like that. And then, yeah, the, the Satanist, the goon, that's what they were. They were Satanists. And, yeah, he said, I saw Tom Cruise the other day. He just started talking to me. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, he bought some adrenochrome from. Him. And he explained to me what it was. He's like, yeah, we get it from kids. He's like, There's kids and, and below the base, and we get it from them. And he said he was the main distributor for the Scientologist, is what he told me. And uh, I, because we were watching like a Mission Impossible movie or something like that, that's how it came up. And I don't know, it was just when something is just so out outlandish, it's like you can't really believe it. You can't wrap your head around it. You don't that's, really think that's yeah. the programming that they put us in. Exactly, because everybody thinks that you. Everybody thinks that they think like them. You know, everybody has that opinion. Like oh, everybody's a decent person, and everybody's a good person, and people wouldn't be like this. But no, it's like there's this. Yeah, there's a crazy clique that runs the world that people don't really get. And uh, yeah, so I went through that for a while, and I remember one time I saw the XO at the Fourth of July party, and um, I we got hot, hot dogs and hamburgers, and you know we got that job, so. I was serving like hot dogs and hamburgers and he came up with his daughter and he said, uh, Petty Officer James, I'd like you to, I'd like to introduce you to my daughter. And I was talking to her and I asked her where she was from. She's in California and stuff like that. She was pretty she was blonde hair, blue eyes. She's probably, I don't know. Whose daughter, whose daughter was this? The executive officer. Okay. The, this, this guy actually knew in the program well, and I had no idea at the time though. And his um, name was Robert. His first name was Robert. And uh, he introduced me to her, and I asked her out, and she said, no, she said, you know, I was like, well, you want to go out sometime? You want to do it? No, and it was kind of one of those things where it was busy. There was a lot of people, like, waiting in line for food. And he came up to me, and he said, uh, do you play guitar, uh, Pet uh, Petty Officer James? And I said, uh, I used to. And he said, well, you should try to take that back up. And he left. And I remember one of the guys came up to me and said, uh, DXO is trying to hook you up with his daughter. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, but she didn't want me. He said, oh, well, you need to try again. <laughs> and it was just a weird thing for, you know, a man to just introduce a complete stranger to his daughter like that. But, um, so yeah, I, I, I was drinking a lot and I was, like I said, I went to a horrible depression. Something was wrong. Like I, Something was wrong with me and I couldn't place it. I remember there was things like one time I was singing 
folding clothes. You know, I was in my room alone, folding clothes, and I was singing, and I was like, I could really sing. Like, how did I, how, how can I sing so well? I can really carry a note now. Uh, it was really disturbing. And I remember one of the guys had a guitar in the room, and uh, I picked it up, and I hadn't played in years, and I just was like wailing on it. Like, I just knew all these scales and everything like that. And I was like, and you know, when it comes to like Jason Bourne movies and stuff like that, it's like when somebody knows a skill that they forgot, they just pick it up immediately and they know it again. But for me, it was really like scary. I was like, holy, you know, like what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, like how is this happening? It was really weird and scary. And I remember being at the smoking area one time, like on the base, and there was this guy Rob there and he, he was smoking and I was just standing there and I smoked at the time. He's like, Why aren't you smoking? And I said, I don't know. And I pulled out like my pack of cigarettes and I said, you know, I've had this pack for two days and I've only smoked five cigarettes. Like, cause I, I didn't need, you know, I didn't have that addiction anymore, but it was like still in my head. Like it was still there. And uh, so, yeah, like I said, I was getting into trouble and I was drinking a lot. And eventually I, you, I was getting out of the military for good. And uh, you go through this thing where you see the master chief of the base, you see the uh, executive officer, and you see the commanding officer. You see the top three guys on base. And it's like, you can say whatever you want to them. You know, you can tell them, you know, fuck off or whatever, but you can't threaten their life. You can't break the law. It's like this tradition you do in the military. So it's like I saw the master chief, and I really didn't have much to say to him. And then uh, I saw the executive officer, and this is this guy Robert. I knew. I didn't know I knew him at the time. I kind of didn't like him. <laughs> but uh, he stood up really slow, and he looked very sad. And then he just appeared at the other end of his desk, like boom, like I just lost three seconds of my life. And I thought I had a stroke. Like I, I said to myself, did I have a stroke? And then he did it again. He appeared right in front of me. And uh, I backed up, I took a step back, and he took a step forward. And in my head, I heard him say, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And I said, yes, back in my head. But it's like uh, when someone's first establishing like, communication, contact with you like that, they want you to make a physical gesture or something so you know it's just not the voice in your head, it's something real. And he said it again. He said, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And I nodded my head, and under my breath, I said, yes. And he kind of sighed and he said, what do you remember? And uh, I said, I remember a, a woman with silver hair and she was tall and sitting down and she had big eyes and big cheekbones, big blue eyes and big, big, big cheekbones. And I said, she had a, a boy on her lap and uh, I kissed the boy on the head and then I kissed her. And he said, that was mother. He said, you had a son with her. And I said, I have a son. He said, you have dozens of sons and hundreds of daughters. And I was just like, what, like, what is he talking about? It was really weird. And I forgot I could do this. I used to do this with my dad when I was a kid. That was something else I didn't talk about. But my dad was like a telepath. We, like, we used to talk when I was very young, I remember when I was a kid. And it was just something as I got older, I outgrew it. And um, yeah, and he was just telling me all this stuff. And he kept on saying, Daryl, you have to go back into the chair. You have to go back in the chair. He's like, something happened. He's like, you didn't go properly down in the fifth density. And, um, you know, you still have some of your memories. He said, people that have memories of the 20 year and back usually commit suicide within the first six months. He's like, something went wrong, but you have to go back. And, uh, he kept, like, I was like, no, like I, I was trying to figure out what the hell was happening. And he said, he said, you know, he said he was acting really weird. He, was, he, he wasn't in the present. He was kind of like, you're going to be really mad at me. Like in the future, when I try to get you to do this again, because I did something to you. And I said, well, what did you do to me? He's like, I can't say. He's like, he wouldn't say. And I was like, what did you do? He's like, you're going to, you're going to remember. As he was going down my timeline, kind of in my present, because he was the density of it. Plus he was augmented. He told me he was from the year 2580, that he came from a timeline where uh, everybody looks like Mike Pence. <laughs> like there was like breeding programs on earth. And they kind of mixed everybody together, and then they found that they made a mistake because the uh, Earth wasn't reaching its true potential. So then they tried to extract DNA that they needed, and it wound up everybody had black hair, um, like a light, like pale skin, kind of a turned up nose, like Mike Pence. He had a constant scowl, like when he would talk, even when he wasn't like angry with you, kind of like Mike Pence, the way he always had that scowl. He had that constant so scowl. He, was come, he was from an alternate reality. Yeah, yeah. He, well, he was from our original reality. He said. He said that. Uh, after Hillary Clinton won the, the election. Um, I witnessed that in other timelines as well. Yeah, yeah. He, he said that uh, we got on our second term, we got into a nuclear war with China that was meant to be lost, and we were 
carpet bomb with nuclear weapons and America fell and uh, it was really bad and they uh, they eventually got to a point where it went further and further into the future and they realized that Earth was not at its true potential like um, so they had to go back in time and change everything and um, I asked him if it worked and he said yes and uh, I said well why are, you, why are you still here I said well is your mom or your parents there he said my mother's gone my father's gone he said my brothers and sisters all my friends I said well why are you still here he said I don't know and uh, yeah, he was just telling me all this stuff, and he told me like, uh, you know, he was telling me about South Park. He well, he told me about the. Well, this is how it came up. I said I remember being drugged because I, I was being drugged by these people when I came back. South and, Park. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll get into that. Too I have a connection to that too. I have a connection to that too. So that's very, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I. I was being drugged when I came back from uh, the 20 year and back and uh, I got, I was, we were underground. I had I was, something else I forgot to say was I had like clay on the tops of my feet when I woke up. I didn't know why because I was being drugged naked in my feet. The tops of my feet were being drugged on the ground and I had a man on my left side and a woman on my right. And the woman said, uh, I'm tired. Let's take a break. And she dropped me and the man was like still holding me. And I looked over, I was really out of it. And I saw like these dog kennels that looked like they were stacked up. I don't know, like about five high and about, I don't know, five, six wide or so. That would probably, oh, I don't know, about four high and about five or six wide. And uh, there were like kids in it, like huddled in the back, I saw. like It looked like silhouettes. It was dark. And I saw like a spider, like a man, like a, a chimera. And it was like, uh, it had like the legs of a spider, the torso of a man. It had like black eyes in the front. And then they got smaller more black eyes going up as it went up he had like a tough hair on top his he had black tough hair that started at the elbow and then went on to the rest of his hand and instead of hands he had like two claws like a spider's claw like the end of their legs and he had fangs and i remember he was just staring straight ahead and he was like motionless like a spider would be and i one of the guys said let's just feed him the max and that was the name of it I found out later. and they said no we're going to figure out what aquino wants to do and one of the kids came up a little girl looked like scurried up to the cage and slammed their hands on the cage and like stared at like looked at me really big eyed their eyes were like black because of the uh, they were so dilated like they never saw the light or anything like that it was very dim in here she had very dilated eyes and her hair was matted and she was very pale and uh so robert i i said to robert i said i remember kids i said what were the kids for robert what were the kids for and he said uh he kept on trying to change the subject and i wouldn't let him do it i just kept on saying what were the kids for and he said, well, have you ever seen that movie, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? And I said, yeah. And he said, you remember the adrenochrome scene? And I said, yeah. He said, well, that's where it comes from. It comes from kids in underground bases. And he told me that they electrify the cages, which causes the kids, it causes the adrenaline to kick in. They, they send the current through it and it shocks them and it shocks them unconscious. They pull them out, strap them to a table, and they give them like a spinal tap right where like the skull and the spine meet. And that's how they extract the adrenochrome. And he told me about, he said, Tom Cruise was in it. You know, he was on the space. He took it. He told me that uh, Jack White from the White Stripes, um, that album, Little Ghost, that just came out probably a year ago at the time. So it was some very uh, current event. And he told me that he was the main distributor for uh, the music industry. That's why he said he's going to retire soon because he has so much money from selling adrenochrome. And he retired pretty much right after that first, that album. And he said the song "Little Ghost" was about uh, the kids in the underground bases, and on the song That's on the album. Fucked. And he said, uh, you know, you go up to heaven because they die so quick. He said they. I said, well, you know, a kid that young would die. The music industry. I have like deep connections to that, and it's absolutely fucked. And anyone that's famous in the music industry on that level is evil. Exactly. That's, that's what he told me. Exactly. Yeah, and he said like, uh, and then I thought I was holding a hand, but I was holding a glove. He said the kids are in cages for so long, they're like veal. So when you touch like their, if you touch their skin, like the sinuate hasn't connected properly with the skin. So it feels like you just pull their skin off because they never leave these cages. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I've seen it. I've been there. I know it's real. It's just, it's just. 
What were you saying about the guys from South Park, though? Well, he yeah, and he told me Tom Hanks was like the 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 kingpin of Adrenochrome sales, and they got him like in Australia and things like that. So in about the whole, he told me about the flu and everything like that. You know, the Wu flu and all that stuff. And uh, but yeah, he said, you know, the guys from uh, South Park, and I said, yeah, Trey Parker and Matt Stone. Yeah, he's like, remember when they went to the Oscars? I said, yeah, they went in drag and they're on acid. And he, he laughed and he said, yeah. He said, you know what? They did that. And I said, no. He says, because they hate them. And I said, who? He said, Hollywood. He said, they hate them. And I said, why? He said, because they're scum. And he said, all of them, they're all just scum. And he told me about, uh, they eventually, like, uh, the military would approach them, like the positive people in the military would approach them and uh, give them a script. You know, not an exact, just a, just kind of like a, you know, premise to follow, like a, some sort of a script. They would fill in like the, you know, the extras, but it was the adrenochrome episode of South Park. And he said that he called it soft disclosure. I'm not sure if he ever saw the adrenochrome episode of, of the South Park show, but yeah, he said it was like a Here's way another one that they have. Okay. There's, a, there's an episode, there's an episode with the South Park guys where there's, uh, the people, the, the goo backs. They go back in time to steal everybody's jobs, right? Mm -hmm. I dreamt that entire episode. I was still a pretty a young child, like you know, you get a little like a boy still, but I dreamt that whole episode before that episode ever aired. And obviously, I've got time travel stuff going on. I'm connected to Montauk, and I, that, that it always freaked me out because I remember when the episode came on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I I had already seen the whole entire episode in a dream, and it's about people coming from the future to the past. Like it was an, obviously a message to me from somewhere. And I remember what's weird about the dream is I remember there's a part where the 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 people from the future have a car, and it's got like the thing where the car goes back and forth and figure what they're called, but you know like low riders do and stuff like that and they're freak they're and i could i saw them animating it and i could hear them talking in the studio and stuff and here's another thing is there's in the future i don't know if it'll happen in this timeline but they make a show once all this stuff comes out they kind of make fun of a lot of the people who are super soldiers in the programs who did all these evil things like fuck you why should we feel sorry for you they make a whole episode about that like about how we're seen as victims and we're seen as uh, like people like me who are in the programs were forced to do all the horrible these horrible things. Like people are looking at us as victims and feeling sorry for us, and they don't look at it that way. And they express it artistically, and they make a whole episode, and they like make fun of me in the episode and stuff like that. This happens in possible futures. I've seen it, but yeah, it's just weird. You say the the South Park guys uh, aren't connected to the the Hollywood. Just those people are are very terrible. I'm not talking about the guys from South Park, but the, the obviously the people in Hollywood. It's all connected to the CIA and Satanism and and the military. It's all connected. It's all the same thing. In fact, like a uh, couple, an episode like or two before this, that's basically what we talked about for the whole episode. Is how it's just all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it kind of makes sense. Like I said, he he said there were like for, forced breeding programs in his timeline, and that's kind of like why everybody looked. Uh similar so i saw that episode of south park with the people from the future taking everyone's job yeah they all kind of look the same and yeah yep. he said like you know everybody looks like mike like all the women look pretty much like mike pence's wife you know black hair you know and even his daughter the one with the blonde hair <laughs> it you sounds like such a it sounds yeah, like you, such a terrible timeline you can tell his daughter bleaches his, her hair and because you know somebody that has jet black hair and they try to bleach their hair it turns more like like orange kind of and she has like mm -hmm. that bleached orange kind of hair uh mike pence's daughter but yeah and he said he's no good he says he, like he's into like child trafficking and all that stuff yeah no you there's know, there's there's a testimony of some woman i can't say her name but she sued she sued them the government recently and she basically talked about how uh she's seen rituals and better part of rituals where George Bush Sr. would be there, Pence would be there, all these different people, and they'd, they'd do stuff to a child and then eat their brains and stuff. It's really sick shit. And they killed their son for for putting that for filing the lawsuit. Her son's died. He he died in a car crash, and they'd been trying to kill her. Uh, I found out about this like three months ago. I, I It's been a while since I looked into it, but, yeah, it's all true. It's all so hard to accept. I mean, I was there like, I heard about this stuff already and knew about this stuff for probably four years. 
And for a while, I just didn't want to accept that it could be true because it's like, it's like you said, you want to believe that people are better than that and that that kind of evil can't ex exist in the world. People don't want to accept the fact that there's like trafficking and torture and all these horrible things happening where they live, you know? Yeah, yeah. He told me about, well, you were, you were going on about, yeah, about what politicians do. And he, well, he told me about like, what was it Spielberg? Yeah. And uh, Heather O'Rourke. She was like a, a blonde girl who was in the old Poltergeist movies that, that Spielberg uh, directed. She was like a platinum blonde. He said that, uh, I don't know, like this gets kind of graphic, but this was something he told me. And he said, um, Henry Wink Winkler was there and he was the Fonz in Happy Days. It was like an old 70s show. And uh, Heather O'Rourke played like the Fonz's like girlfriend's daughter. And uh, he said there was, so Spielberg, Henry Winkler, and two movie producers were in the same room all participating in it. And they sodomized her to death with a, what do you call it? An Oscar trophy. And he said, how many kids do you ever hear of that die from their, you know, intestines spontaneously just tearing, rupturing? Because that's what they said it was. They said that, like, her intestines ruptured, and she got bile into her bloodstream, and she died of a fever. And, uh... He said, "Yeah, they did that to her, and that's like that was them, and that's how it Heather worked." So died. fucking evil. They're so fucking evil. And he told me about like I asked why well, I asked about you know he knew so much about celebrities. It seemed like that's what he was part. He knew like all the all the people in Congress. He knew like all the celebrities, all the singers. And he, I asked him what, what happened to uh, Michael Jackson. You know, is, is Michael Jackson? Is it true what they say about him? And he said, "Yes." He said, "But it's not his fault." And I said, what do you mean? And he said that his father raped him his entire life and then pimped him out sexually to the music industry. He said uh, Joe Jackson made more money off pimping out Michael than he did off Jackson 5 albums. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with Britney Spears and all of those pop stars. I am I, actually um, uh, I did an interview with Penny Bradley where I talked about it for the first time. If people want to talk, check it out. It's really hard for me to talk about, but I've witnessed all of that. I witnessed it personally. Um uh, they, there's a reason why Britney Spears got signed over at 15 and then brought to Sweden because at 15, that's the age of consent there technically. So they could do whatever they wanted to her. And she was, it's the same thing. They were, they were, and they were doing sexual rituals uh, for the songs to make and putting the energy in that they have this ritual where they do where they'll gang rape someone. And while the person is, forced into an orgasm, a forced orgasm, they'll kill the person and then they'll put that energy into the song. So all these songs that you listen to, like a lot of these songs, these hit songs that are very sexually charged, they literally have psychic sexual energy put into them uh, through this, these, these rituals. Like if people knew the stuff that went into the, their favorite, some of the music that they're listening to, they would, they'd be blown away by it. It's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what he said. Yeah, he said he said they're all in on it, like all of them. It's like it's not even a, a thing. Like, if they're if they're a big name label or anything like that, yeah, they're in on it. They're they're into the adrenochrome. They're into pedophilia. They do all that stuff. And then he started telling me about um, I forget what he I forget how he, how it came up, but he said uh, he said something like, you know, he well, he said we're gonna start executing people and things like that. He said we're gonna execute the Clintons. And I said, oh, thank God. I said, I hate them. He said, he's like, really? And he, I said, yeah. He said, why? And I said, uh, well, they're murderers. And he like got right in my face. And he said, uh, who told you that? Like, how did you know that? Like, who told you that? And I said, well, anytime anybody, um, inter like, anybody investigates them, they always wind up jumping out of a building or dying out of a, of a drug overdose and things like that. And he said, oh, yeah, well, that's true. And he said, he said, but you don't understand. He said, they're like Jeffrey Dahmer murderers. He said, they're like bad murderers. I said, what do you mean? And uh, well, he, he told me about the reason why she goes to uh, Haiti every year. Like the Clintons are always going to Haiti. And Trump just brought this up in one of his last, uh, you know, campaign kind of brouhaha's. But uh, yeah, he's like, oh, Bill Clinton's always going to Haiti. And uh, he said that Hillary Clinton is a uh, Santeria, I think they call it, like the voodoo religion. She's a yeah. high-ranking witch. And like her master is in Haiti. She goes to Haiti every year. 
and like sacrifices children and things like that. Yeah, there's there's all those organizations where they're rescuing kids and helping the kids Red Cross, in, in Haiti. They're actually kidnapping kids. Yeah. Yeah, and there there was recently even a group who busted one of the ritual sacrifice rooms there. It had the red door leading into it and stuff like that. Um it, it that happened fairly recently in Haiti. So um yeah, it's absolutely disgusting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, he and, and and then he he said I saw a video and you didn't want to talk about it. He said I just saw it three days ago, and uh, he was like forced to per, uh, participate in the torture of me like five days ago. But for me, it was almost two years because he time traveled so much. And uh, he, he kept on saying like I didn't know, like I didn't know, like I didn't know that was gonna happen. I was like, well, why did you? Why were you smiling at me at the Fourth of July party and stuff like that? He's like, I didn't know, and he, he was trying to get me to understand like you know time travel is confusing and like you know i didn't at the time i wasn't doing that to you like that was like 20 years ago to me you know what i mean i was like even though it's only less than only about two years it was 20 years to me because i was off world and i was doing all these different things yeah and he, he said he saw this video three days ago and he didn't want to bring it up he's like he's like daryl don't make me say it he's like i just saw it three days ago and he was like gnashing his teeth and he was like clenching his fist together he was really upset and uh, he said, there's a video, and he told me about the Frazzle Drip video. And he said, there's a video where Hillary Clinton cuts a little girl's face off, and uh, she's mocking her with the face, like holding over her face, like at the mask, and like mocking her with it, and the girl screaming. And he said, that's why we're, you know, going to execute the Clintons publicly. He's like, because the world's going to demand it. He's like, you're not just going to see like a girl. He's like, you're going to see your daughter when you see this. And, uh, yeah, he told me about that. He was pretty upset about that. But yeah, he told me about the Frazzle drip. He told me about the Q thing. He said it's going to be real at first. He said, but then it's going to go away for five or six months. But when it comes back, he said, that's not real. He said, but it doesn't matter because it's already going to start. Yeah, I heard that. That's when the, the, the server changed from where Q was, Q was talking from. And obviously, it wasn't the same person anymore. And it just became this big propaganda machine. Exactly. Yeah. He said in the very beginning it was real, but, but then, yeah, it would go away and then it would come back. And yeah. And he was just telling me like all this stuff and he told me, all, you know, things about the future. He said the world's going to be on fire. And I yeah. Said, like, right. Well, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Is that, that's direct. And did he say how it was directed energy weapons and it was manufactured or did he not talk about that? Well, well he said it was just people. He, he talked about direct energy weapons. He, well, I, I, yeah. And he talked about people were just lighting them on fire, like in Australia, like they were just hiring people to just light fires in Australia. He said a third of Australia would be on fire. This happened years back. He said the koala bear would become endangered. And he said that the eucalyptus tree was actually genetically engineered by like, I don't know if it was ETs or what to, uh, continue to uh, not only, you know, catch on fire, but cause forest fires to go out of control because the sap is very flammable and the trunk begins to boil with heat and then it's, it, the entire trunk will explode and just shoot fire everywhere. He said, yeah, yeah, the eucalyptus trees were actually designed that way. And uh, yeah, and then he said like, you know, I said, well, what do you mean? Like New York City's gonna be on fire? And he's like, no, not like that. He's like, but like the Midwest, to the West, he's like, riots are gonna happen. He, and then he said it would start out with comic books is how he put it. And he said, uh, he said they, they uh, start with, he, he said they kill Spider-Man off. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, he's a, uh, he said they kill him off and they replace him with a guy named Miles Morales. who's like a, a half Hispanic, half black kid. And I said, uh, well, that sucks. And, Holy shit, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said, cause I like Spider-Man. I, I got comic books on the base at the time. I was like in my twenties and I was like, I still got comic books. And it was a small base. So everybody knew and uh, everybody knew each other's business. So he knew, like, I read comics, and he was like, yeah, they kill off Spider-Man. And he's like, well, it's not, not the main continuity. He said it's Ultimate Spider-Man. And I said, why do they do that? And he, he's like, he said, they start off the lowest level possible and see what your reaction is. And then he said they're going to work their way up the movies. He's like, they're going to make all these remakes, and they're going to be horrible. You know, they, they want to destroy, like, your old heroes and stuff like that. That's what he said. And then he said they're going to eventually work their way up to uh, statues, and then they're going to start tearing your statues down. But he said that's how they do it. They try. They do it the lowest level possible and slowly work their way up to see the reaction of the public. But he said, yeah, that's how they do it. And um, yeah, and, uh, I don't know. He was just telling me all this stuff. And yeah, the world's gonna be on fire. And then it, yeah, I asked about 9/11 because that that was still something pretty fresh. 
And he said that uh, that was done by many nukes. He said they have nukes like the size of like hockey pucks. And uh, they were going to, what's happening right now was going to happen back then. And that's where like the trillions went. Donald Rumsfeld come on TV and like said, like we're missing like three or four trillion dollars. And he said that was like the uh, secret space program that took all that money. And he said that um, then the very next day, 9-11 happened. And it was just like everybody forgot about all these trillions of dollars. Yep. Went and he said that uh, what, what happened was, is, you know, the people in the military, they were ready to come out and just stop all of this, all this endless war and all this disease and, you know, all this, you know, people dying of just diseases that we don't need to die of anymore, cancer, this, you know, all these disabilities and things that people don't, you know, don't need to have. And they were about to release everything back then but the uh, satanists they blew up the world trade center and that's what it was about and they said you know i knew you, that yeah d don't don't try to stop us because there's nukes hidden all over the world and you don't know where they're at and we'll blow them all up it, it's up like you try to stop us so what they've been doing ever since september 11th till today they're, they're finding like all these nuclear weapons that are hidden all throughout the world and disarming them, getting rid of them. Taking, so, taking so my, the 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 uh, twin towers had documents and proof and things that could take the cabal down. Essentially, is what you're saying? N no, not necessarily that. It was just a show of force that the cabal was showing them. They were gonna like just like you know get rid of every like the military was just gonna the positive guys in the military were just gonna come in. They were gonna get rid of all the satanist generals and admirals, kill them all off, execute them. They were gonna sounds like a fucking good plan. Yeah, yeah, and they were gonna do what, what's basically happening right now. They were gonna do back then, start releasing medical technology, ET tax, things like that. They're gonna start doing that back then. So you know, the cabal just said like, hey, they just, they blew up 9/11. Was like, if you try to stop us, this this is gonna happen all over the world. We have bombs hidden all over the world. We're gonna do this everywhere if you try to stop us. So like the the white hats kind of stood back in the sense that you know they didn't want that many casualties. So they had to start from square one basically all over again. For people for people who aren't familiar with the term, I know a lot of the audience is, but for for maybe the few in the audience who aren't, what's a what's a white hat? Like the positive being the people who don't want, you know, it's just because they're in the military doesn't mean they want constant war. He told me, you know, once you get up to like a, a higher a highest level, you get to choose which side you want to be on. There's always like a sense of choice. Like you have to give you choice. And he told me once you get the Roman Eagle which is like a captain in the Navy and a colonel and everything else. It almost becomes like a, a completely different military. You know, you, first you get your Eagle and then you become Admiral or General after that. He said, but they have, you have to be given a choice. Like you have, you want to cho choose the positive side or the negative side. And he said, most choose negative because you get more money and power that way. And it's easier. And uh, very few choose positive, but he said, you know, we're getting all outside help. He told me Kruger is helping us with all this. And I said, like, who's Kruger? And he said, Kruger is a, uh, like a corporation from a Germany and a, and an alternate universe. And it's like, we know about eight, eight different universes, I think is what he said. And like Kruger's going around trying to like, you know, help all these different universes out and stuff like that. I remember I told him, I said, uh, you know, I was getting out of the military and I said, I'm going to see that doctor tomorrow. You know, he told me all these people that were off world Germans. And I said, you make sure you know who 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 he is. You make, you make sure to tell him who I am and who he is. And he told me he was. I was like the king of these people. He called them Tajetans. They were like the Nordics, is what he said. They're, the, the military calls them Nordics and things like that. And but it wasn't really sinking in. But at the same time, it was like I knew why I was depressed. Like something was taken from me. You know, I had like a family that was taken from me, and it was it was starting to make sense. Slowly starting to make sense to me. And. Uh, you know, I told him, I said, I'm seeing that doctor tomorrow who's an off-world German. I said, you make sure you know who I, who, who I am. You make, make sure to tell him that. And I saw him, you know, it was like my final physical before getting out of the military. And I just walked in and I glared at him. And uh, I was pissed. Uh, I was pretty upset. And I didn't say anything to him. I didn't serve him or anything like that. And he said to me, like, I, I heard it telepathically. I heard him say, like, uh, you know, I wasn't involved with what happened to you. He's like, I, I didn't participate in that. I just want you to know that. And I, I said, uh, I said, a spy is a spy. I got pissed off. And he said, uh, you know, we're helping you, right? He's like, we're actually helping you. And he, he kind of, he led me to, to believe that there was like almost like a, 
a faction of like these off-world Germans that broke away from the, the reptilian empire, uh, the draconian empire, and uh, they're actually helping Earth is what he kind of like led me to believe. Uh, but I'm not 100% on any of that. This is just stuff I knew firsthand. And um, so I was getting out, and it was like a Friday or something like that or Saturday, and I was going to go to the airport in London the next day. And I'd like, you know, or I was actually, no, this was a Friday, and I was probably going to leave to the airport on like a Sunday, I think is what it was. And I, I heard like a, oh, something early in the story I forgot to say, they have a technology, it's the 5G tech. We were talking about all this stuff, about me joining the program, having a high IQ, and the, and the guys were, uh, one of the guys told me he was on the moon. And he's like, yeah, there's brothels up there, and it's what encourages you to work, you know, you, your only motivation to work is sex and things like that. Robert told me that that's where they get, you know, the women that at these brothels on the moon, that's where they get the children from. They put them in a, a looking glass technology portal. They put them in a portal and they, they wind up in the uh, underground bases. And they're the ones that are used for the adrenochrome harvest. And, like that. and uh, yeah, he was telling me about this stuff about, you know, he was great. And I told him, you know, uh, well, the, you know, the XO told me I was going to be a pilot of a four kilometer starship. And he said, yeah, that's you. Because I thought maybe the XO said to everybody and I was just being like, cool. And he said, no, nah, man, he's like, you're going to be up there. He's like, I just volunteered. Like, nobody asked me to do anything. I, I just worked in the underground base and I volunteered for it. And, uh, yeah, when we were talking about this, I heard almost like a like a feedback, like an intercom feedback. And it says something like, now hear this, now hear this. You are now in violations of a uh, uniform code of military justice, articles 55, 56, something like that. It was just going on. He said, if you don't uh, stop right now, you'd face, you know, up to 10 years in prison and a hundred thousand dollars in fines and that'll be all and it went away and i said what was that and like none of the guys i'm going to talk about it i said oh we shouldn't talk about it anymore they're listening to us and then uh one of the guys on base that guy um, lando the one that watched star wars all the time he he came to me the next day and he said uh hey did you hear that you know that voice that intercom in the in the, in the room and there was no speaker or anything like that so it didn't make any sense and i said yeah he said, did you see those towers? And there was a, you know, an antenna tower by the underground base and it had dishes on it, but then it had like these uh, rectangular blocks. And I never saw that before. This was like a 2003 at the time. And he said, that's 5G technology. He said, it's an experimental thing here. He said, they can do that. He said, they can create a microwave beam. They can put it into a room. They can look around. They can hear everything. They can see everything. And they can talk to you if they want. And he said, they, you know, nobody has to come into your room and bug it, or put cameras. They, they, just, they could just do this with this 5G tech. So that was like new to me. And uh, yeah, and so I was going to sleep and all of a sudden I heard that same kind of feedback in the room. And it's, and I was, you know, staying in like a different barracks. They built new barracks in the, in the space. And I'm staying in the new barracks. And uh, I heard uh, him say, you know, he was kind of good cop, bad cop in me. He was like, you know, they're all, everything we talked about before, I'll do it. Because he was promising me, me all this stuff that he could do to me for, on the med bed. You know, he was like, you know, I, I can make you stronger and I can, you know, help you with this. And I can help you get, get rid of old injuries and things like that. He's like, I can help you with all these different things. And he's like, they're all, everything we talked about before, I, I'm still willing to do it. If you can come to the base right now, you know, and, you know, get back into the chair. So I can wipe your mind and we can get, get over with this and stuff like that. Cause I left the room, like I left the office when I, you know, I just told him to go fuck off basically. And I left and it was like the final day here. And he said that to me. And I said, like, I remember what you did to me now. Cause I was remembering more stuff. And I said, you gutted me. And, you know, like a Kino hot handed him a knife and he, he, you know, it's not necessarily like forced in the sense of, you know, it, Robert told me that they'd hurt my daughter if I didn't do whatever they told me. They use your kids against you. Yeah. And yeah, he, he said they'd hurt my daughter if I didn't do it, what they told me to do to you. And he still wasn't explaining it to me. But, you know, in the room, I remember like days went by and I remembered mm -hmm. more and more. I was thinking about it and I was remembering more and more. And uh, I said, you know, you cut it, you, you gutted me, you, you cut me. And he said, uh, you know, I think I, I think I heard him crying a little bit over the speaker. Um, he said, I'm sorry, you know, they would have hurt my daughter and, I said, well, if I was you and you were me and, you know, I came up to you and I said that there was this life, you know, you, you, you lived and you had all these, all these, you know, you had a wife and kids. And I, I said, would you be willing to go back in the chair and get your mind rewiped? You know, if you didn't remember your wife and child anymore, and he said, I don't know. 
And uh, I said, you know, your words are, I said, your words are poison. Everything you say is poison. I blamed everything on him, joining the program, getting taken back, everything. And uh, I said, may God let you die with blood in your mouth, is what I said. So I was pissed. Because he told me he thought about suicide all the time in the office. And he said he would put a 45 in his mouth and blow his brains out. That's what he thought he would do. Because I asked him if he would commit suicide. And, said, yeah. and yeah, I said that to him. I put the pillow over my head. And I could hear him like, wimp, like you know, please, Joe, you have to go back. You have to go back. And uh, eventually he just went away and, you know, I uh, got out of the Navy, got back, you know, and well, he, he told me their names. He told me some of their names and I read them. I wrote them down like on a, on a post-it note and I was reading it every day in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, the names of what? Of like the Tajetans that I knew. One was Swaru and I believe mother's name was uh, Sharayi is what he said was another one and uh i was reading them every day and i, I got to a point where like if, if i read this all the time i'm going to kill myself i had it in my wallet like on a little post you know, that i wrote down in his office and uh i threw it away and i just kind of just carried on with my life i don't know i have this ability i, I think from when i was a kid to just if something is too tra traumatic for me that i could just kind of say you know no that didn't happen like nope and I just kind of blocked it out of my it's head. Very, it's a very natural human response, actually. It's more common than people think it is. Yeah, and I just carried on with my life. And he kept on saying to me, you know, your life's going to be hard. And he was looking down my timeline to make sure I wasn't going to commit suicide when I was in the office with him. And he was, like, predicting my future. He could do that. And he got to a point where he said, well, you make it. And, you know, he said I would live. But uh, he also told me things like med beds were going to come out and all this other stuff. And he talked about all that. He talked about, you know. How far down the line do you think that is? Well, I think it's it was supposed to have already happened. Because I remember he told me in the January. He said he said, he said said the January 6th thing was uh, that's when JFK Jr. was supposed to come out. When he was supposed to, you know, the guy, he was killed in a plane crash, they thought. But he said whenever he said when JFK Jr. came to his plane, he saw wiring hanging out of the uh, landing gear. He said like just some goon did it. Like the Clintons hired just some guy who didn't know what he was doing. He saw he saw the bomb basically like in the in the landing gear. And so he called up Trump because he was best friends with Trump back then. And so what they did was they just uh, remotely flew it like over the water so nobody would get hurt, and then they blew it up from there. And he's been like undercover ever since like he's just been you know just staying low ever since and he was supposed to come out during the whole january 6th thing i guess when he came out when trump was going to come out to the white house jfk jr was going to come out with him but that, i think that's why that whole thing happened where it just the shit hit the fan and they had like plants there to, to cause like basically like a riot because they knew it was going to happen and uh yeah, so I think we're pretty much behind. And he said that. He said they can slow things down, but they can't stop it. He says it's already happened, so it, they can't stop it. Like He's been to our future timeline, and he's seen it. And he's like, yeah, they, they can slow things down, but nothing can be stopped at this point. What's the future and, uh, timeline like? Well, he said, you know, he told me that he asked me where I thought what the world's gold was. <laughs> You know, he told me so much stuff. It's, it's difficult. But I, I'm writing it out in the book, so I know I remember everything. But we talked for about an hour. He asked me where I thought the future's gold was. And I said, you know, the Bank of London, the Bank of England, because I thought it was there. And he said, no, it's in the catacombs of the Vatican. And he said, there's a septillion worth of gold there. He said, it's just like mounds and mounds of gold. And it's not really locked down or anything like that. You just have to go to the basement of the Vatican, and it's all there. And he said, it's going to be, be distributed back to the world. He said, like, you know, wealth is going to be given back to their countries and things like that. Africa's going to get back a majority of the diamonds. A lot of the gold is going to go back to the United States because a lot of it came from the United States. You know, he said Russia would be the uh, world uh, leader. He said that uh, nobody could decide who would be the next world power. So um, they were about to get into a war over that. So they just settled it through um, whoever has the most natural resources would become the next world power. And that's Russia. And then China would become like the economic power so that like China would become like where our currency comes from and uh, Russia would be kind of like the world power. And uh, the United States, he said, is going to be like eighth 
but it's not going to be like a bad thing. It's just, it's just, everything's going to be really nice. He said, as far as economy wise, he said, you're going to be able to pay off a brand new car in six months. He said, you're going to be able to pay a house off in three or four years. Everybody's going to be able to, you know, and this is everybody, you know, every, it doesn't matter what you do and everybody's going to have to work. He said, there's going to be no uh, kind of, there's going to be no welfare programs. He's like, cause we have a, we're going to really rebuild the infrastructure. He said, <clears throat> you know, and we're going to start going into space. We're going to be mining a lot of titanium and things like that for ships. And everybody, you know, we're, we're going to be building a space program, a large, large space program. But we're going to start building, you know, four kilometer long starships for Earth and like that. And we're going to get involved in what's happening right now. And uh, he said that, you know, the reptiles, they lose control of us. He told me we're, we were uh, basically slaves for over a thousand years. We've been slaves. And, uh, you know, but that's all changing now. And, uh, you know, we're getting outside help. But we can't, you know expect people to do this for us he says it has to be the military and he said that things that are happening right now are hard he said but they have to be hard he said because this has to affect our dna memory is how he put it he said yes. the military could step in and just stop everything right now but it would just happen again within 100 years he said the satanists would just start doing it again and it would happen again so you know people are going to die from this this shot he told me about the shot the forced vaccines they're going to get people he said people are going to die from that and, you know, it's going to be difficult. He's like, but it has to be difficult because people I have to, I have to, I don't, I hate to interrupt, but I have to use the bathroom really bad. And I want to still keep going with this interview. So do you mind if I just take a real quick bathroom break? Yeah, sure. I'm real sorry. I'll, I'll be right back. I just, I've had oh. to, and I've been trying to put it off and it's like, I'll be able to do we a lot do a better part job. Two if you want. Should, should, should we just do a part two? Do you think? We've been doing for a hundred or one hour, 20 minutes. So. Well, if you're down to doing a part two and just do a part two nope. uh, later on, I'll do I'm a part two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that sounds good because I feel like you really reeled everybody in, definitely. And of course, uh, everybody loves a good cliffhanger, so let's just do that. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I definitely learned a lot, and you definitely basically confirmed a lot of things for me. Um, and probably the viewers uh, watching this as well, I'm sure everybody that watched it your trove of information so i'm sure everybody's learned a lot so thank you for all you do for this community daryl we, we all appreciate you of course yeah thank you thank you for having me on all right well i'm gonna end the recording and i'm gonna get going uh this is disclosure now we are the disclosure thank you for watching <laughs>